the essence of God in my life. <clears throat> Boy, some powerful things today as we get into God's word. So what's love got to do with it? All you need is love. The power of love. Crazy little thing called love. I will always love you. Love will keep us together. What the world needs now is love. I'm lost in love or I'm all out of love. I want to know what love is. Now, most of you know what those all have in common, right? They're all songs, song titles. That's right. They're all songs. Maybe the younger generation might not know some of those, but uh, yeah, we all recognize those. And it's really interesting because all these song titles say something about love, and we could have come up with countless more song titles, but, but consider some of the great confusion there really is when it comes to love, at least when our, in our culture, like love is powerful and love is crazy and love is a sure thing until it's not. and Love is consuming and love is not important and love is most important. And that last song may say it best, it's love is a question. I want to know what love is. I want to know what love is, and I wonder this morning how you would define love. We're going to define love this morning, and we're going to, de- going to define it in a pretty powerful way. But if we asked, like, the world today, like, how do you define love? I think there's three areas they might land on, like love as the emotions that we feel. People would say, oh, yeah, love is, love is a feeling, you know, until the feeling's gone, and then we realize we look at our marriage license, and we're like, well, okay, love is more than a feeling. Like, I signed my life away on this thing, right? And now I'm committed to somebody, and even when the feelings go away, I'm still supposed to be connected to them and committed to them. So love is more than my emotions. We might say love is the words we speak, and we would all agree, right, that we could all stand to use those words a little more, like, I love you. And, and some people are wired that way. They've got the, the love language of words. And so saying I love you is just like second nature to them. They just love to say I love you. And others, not so much. Some people find it really hard to say those words. I wonder how often do you say those words out loud to the significant people in your life? I love you. And then we would hopefully all come to the point of realizing but love is more than just our words right love comes down to the choices that we make like we can say we love somebody but if we don't make the right choices or we don't prove it by our actions they may question our love there is something about choosing to put somebody else first philippians 2 1 so if there is any consolation in christ any any encouragement in christ any comfort from love any participation in the spirit any affection and sympathy Paul says, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love. We'll talk about what that love is today. Being in full accord and of one mind, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. And that's love right there when I actually make choices and and put others in front of my own wants and feelings and desires. Now, here's the thing. Even with this basic understanding of love, like we just laid it out, like those three things, the culture around us still is asking these these haunting questions. What's love got to do with it? Or, I want to know what love is. So we're going to define love this morning. And as we said, love is more than our feelings. It's more than our words. It it, it goes into our, our choices and our actions. But you know, love even goes deeper than that. We're going to show you this morning how to define love at its most deepest possible point for you and I as believers, and it's going to be pretty powerful to look and see what that is. As I said, this is week three of our sermon series, Fruitology. Fruitology, kind of a fancy word there. I don't think it's a real word, uh, but I found it and I liked it. Uh, Biblical study of the theology of spiritual fruit. That's how I define the word. And in a personal sense, it's how can we live a spiritually fruitful life, which is what we all want. We all want to live fruitful lives, right? And uh, we're going to talk about that throughout the series. Uh, we talked here, uh, this is the big idea really, or no, I didn't put it on the screen. Um, the, the big idea here really is that the spiritually fruitful life is the abundant life. Like when we talk about a spiritually fruitful life, that's the abundant life. Christ came that we would have abundant life and everybody wants abundant life. Like, yeah, give me more of life. And uh, Well, you know, maybe you don't want more of life if your life isn't really like spiritually fruitful. Like, some people are like, I don't want any more of my life. Like, no, stop, please. Because they don't know Christ. And if you know Christ, though, the spiritually fruitful life is the abundant life. 
Now, I want to start where we were last week. We started last week in the Garden of Eden, and I want to start there again just briefly. As we talked last week, right, we talked about how we were created in God's image, like all cre- creation is created after their own kind, but we're created after God's kind. We're created in God's image. We talked about the significance of what that means even in the uh, cultural uh, setting of the world today, how the world needs to know that message. But think about this. When we think about being created in God's image, here's, here's just one of the implications of that. There's four or five we could list, maybe more. But being created in God's image, we were given a free will, the ability to choose. And And so I always use this illustration, and I'll just revisit it here just for a second. But in the Garden of Eden, when God created Adam and Eve and gave them that free will, he put two trees in the garden. And those two trees symbolically represent, and and most, I think, miss this, represent the choices that even today you and I get to make. Like those two trees stand as a testimony for all time that every day we get up, we get to choose. Am I going to feast off of the life of Christ and live in the spirit or am I going to go over here uh, in the flesh, right? Am I going to embrace the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the tree of knowledge, right? The, The tree of good and evil, the tree of right and wrong. And we've looked at this many times and we've put that diagram many, many times before in your notes. But the two trees in Eden represent our daily choice. Every day we get to choose. Like those two trees represent our choice of salvation. Like am I trusting Christ for my salvation or am I trusting my own good works? And of course there's only one way that saves us, Christ. Only one person. But even then, once we're saved, every day we have that daily choice. John 15, 4 and 5 says it this way, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And so the reality is you want a fruitful life, you want the abundant life, you have to abide in Christ you just have to you just have to hang over here and live in the spirit now abiding in Christ really is simply saying you're saved like if you're saved you are abiding in you are in Christ if you're not saved you're not abiding in Christ you're abiding in the world or in the flesh but every day we get this choice that I get to live over here in the spirit walk in the spirit operate in the Spirit. And so the reality is in this series is that I cannot bear my own fruit. It's impossible for me to bear my own, I I cannot bear fruit on my own. Okay, I I didn't read it right. I cannot bear fruit on my own. If I'm not abiding over here, if I'm not fellowshipping over here with Christ, walking in the Spirit, I won't bear spiritual fruit. I don't know if I put this, I did put it on the screen here. So here's this diagram we often use, right? The tree of life and the tree of good and evil. One is walking in the Spirit One is walking in the flesh. One is relational living. One is rules-based living. One is grace and one is law. Like we've talked about this before, how this tree of the knowledge of good and evil parallels the law of God. Like, right, and God never intended for us to live under a law. Christ came to satisfy the law and to get us away from the law and back into a relationship. And then there's mercy versus condemnation. And then even here, looking farther, there's this idea of the fruit of the light and the unfruitful works of darkness that, that Paul talks about. And we can see where each of these fall. And if you want a spiritually fruitful life, you have to walk in the Spirit over here. And that's the choice you and I get to make every day. Because we were created in God's image and we get to make choices. How awesome is that? In Romans 8 and 9, Paul weighs in here. You, however, are not in the flesh but in the Spirit If in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. So he's saying that if you know Christ as your Savior, the Spirit of God indwells you. This is your default position over here. You were wired, God's Spirit lives in you, you'll live in harmony. God's Spirit is in you, so when you're over here walking in the Spirit, you're walking in harmony. Anytime you walk over here in the flesh and God's Spirit is in you, there's going to be disharmony in your life. There's going to be, you know, all kinds of, life's not going to be peaceful, it's going to be stressful. If you ever have great stress in your life, I mean, we're going to go through difficulties, but if you're ever going through circumstances and, and, and things just really seem off in life, ask yourself, am I walking in the spirit or am I walking in the flesh? 
Important to note that, important indeed to know that. Today's big idea is simply this then. Bearing the fruit of love is embodying the essence of God. Like we're gonna talk today about the fruit of love and define it. And bearing the fruit of love, it's the, the, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, and so on. Bearing the fruit of love is embodying the very essence of God. And we're gonna start there and just kind of unpack that a little bit. Here's the key verse again in Galatians 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. We'll look at that in a little while. And there's just some great stuff in there that we can see. Here today then, how can we be more loving, right? Because we all want to be more loving. We all want to produce more spiritual fruit. We all want to be, have a more fruitful life, a more peaceful life, and joyful life, a more patient life, a more, right? We don't want to be stressed out. So we're going to define the love today that then can define us as we embody the essence of God. Philippians 1 9, Paul said it this way, and it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. God, Paul prayed that we would just be more and more and more and more loving. And we're praying the same thing, right? We meet people at work or in our, you know, in our extended family, sometimes in the home, wherever it might be, and we're like, Lord, give me more patience, give me more compassion, give me more strength so I can be more loving. Because it is really, really challenging, and we'll see that as we go through the message today. Let's start here. We're going to define this today. We're going to start, though, before we get into the three definitions of love. 1 John 4, 7, central verse here, beloved. Here's John. John and Paul use the word love more than anybody else in the New Testament. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. We've all heard that, right? God is love. What does that mean that God is love? Well, I kind of want to walk through that a little bit because this is really incredibly important. And one of the greatest pieces of commentary that has really helped me kind of shape my understanding of this, uh, I shared this years ago, and I'm going to revisit it this morning. God in His Essence and His Attributes by J.N. Darby. He was a theologian from the 1800s. I'm going to read some of his quote here and just kind of walk through it so we understand what does it mean when it says God is love and what does that mean in your life and mine? Hopefully this makes sense, okay? Here's what, here's what Mr. Darby says on this issue of God in his, in his um, essence and attributes. Okay, attributes are relative, Hence, God, who is absolute, cannot be spoken of as being the attribute itself. It is only a character which belongs to him. So try to follow me. This is a little scholarly, maybe. God is something in himself, but he is also something in relationship to other things, you and me, when they exist or are supposed to exist. The attributes may be a necessary consequence of what he is, and I suppose in God always is, but is not what he is himself. I don't know if that makes sense, if you can follow that or not at this point. But what he is saying here is that we can come up with several attributes that we might see as the character of God, but that's not who he is. That's just what he possesses. Who he is is different from the character that he possesses. See, he's saying God is somebody when no one else is around. That's who God is. And then God is somebody when we are present, when the world that he created is present, then God is something in relation to that. So we go on. We have already got into the discussion of the relative qualities in God. That is what supposes other things besides the absolute being. If God is righteous, though he be so, he must be so towards others, towards you and me. It is relative. There are two words applied to God which reveal His nature, love and light, and only these two. They affirm what He is in nature, not any attribute. The essence of God is His love and light. So he goes on. These, as I have said, are not attributes. Attributes are ideas which we attach to God in connection with what what is outside of Himself though belonging necessarily to him as God. He is omnipotent, omniscient, supreme, even righteous, holy. These, these, though, more connected with his nature are relative terms. I must think of God's dealings and claims to call him righteous. He judges of something when he is righteous, only it affirms he always judges right. To call him holy, I must think of evil, which he rejects. Hence, he is not called righteousness and holiness, but righteous and holy holy 
Through him, all is exactly brought out in its true character. So hence, finally, we say God in himself is absolutely love and light, the last expressing perfect purity, invisible in itself and manifesting everything as it is before God and showing the way before us. Does that make any sense to you? It's basically God is primarily two things. He is love and he is light. And everything else he is are just just character traits in relationship to you and me. So like God is omniscient, but why? Well, because of the world that he created. That's not a, maybe a, the best one, but like, like God is omnipresent because he created space. And so God is now omnipresent because there is space. God is eternal. Why? Because he created, you know, time. And now he's eternal compared to time. So that's the, the what darby is saying there god is love and light that's who he is that's the essence of god his love and his light his goodness and his glory the other traits are all relative to you and me so bearing the fruit of love is embodying the essence of god so to bear the fruit of love love is the very essence of god and i'm embodying that in my life i'm letting other people see the love of god in me when i bear the fruit of love let's define it this morning uh we're going to define it in three ways see what kind of love the father has given to us that we should be called children of god and so we are love is number one the devotion of the father love is the devotion of the father he is devoted we we have a god who is devoted he loves us he is devoted to you and me and even that when we think about that when we think think about god being the father even that adds a clear clarification right like either god is the father or god is your father ah oh, right like god is 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 god your father or is god just the father that, that says something in and of itself. And the reality is God wants to be your father, wants to adopt you into his eternal family. And he is devoted to that end. Now, I love that word devotion. Chose it deliberately. Instead of commitment, I chose devotion. Devotion, here's my definition of devotion. It is commitment plus affection equals love. It's like God is not just committed to us in sort of a begrudgingly way. Well, I created them. I got to be committed to them. It's like God is committed to you because he has affection for you, because he loves you, because he cares about you, and he wants to adopt you into his family. God came up with this redemptive plan, and he never, ever, ever abandoned that plan. Even in the days of Noah, when things got so bad and evil was so great, what did God do? Well, God wiped out the world and started over with Noah, but he didn't just like abandon the plan. He didn't just give up on the plan or fast forward the plan. One of the things we learn in this nature, in this sense then that can be helpful to you and me is that true love goes beyond our feelings. Like true love goes beyond our feelings and like, yeah, there was a time and point when God regretted making mankind like things had gotten really bad in the days of Noah. But that didn't stop him from loving us because he was devoted to us think of god's love like this god in a real sense is the father of all creation he created everything the bible says though that we created in his image under the lineage of adam have wandered away we all like sheep have gone our own way we've we've strayed from the fold and god sent jesus to bring us back in he wants to adopt us into his family we're all walking around in the world i mean not everyone but a lot of people that are walking around fatherless and aimless in the world and god wants to adopt them into his family galatians 4 4 but when the fullness of time had come god sent forth his son born of a woman born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons and because you are sons god has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts crying abba father so just understand today that God loves you. He wants to be your father, your spiritual father. All you have to do is just believe that Jesus Christ is God, that he came to die on the cross for your sins. And yeah, we're all sinners. That's not hard. Just confess your sin to God. Say, I believe you died for my sin. And I'm receiving today your forgiveness. And I'm receiving your love. And when you do that, what will happen? Oh, it's just beautiful there in verse 6, right? 
God will send the Son, the Spirit of His Son into your hearts crying, Abba, Father. Like the Spirit comes in and it's like, Daddy, 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 Daddy. He is the Father we've all longed for. He's the Father we're all desperate for and He has been so devoted to, to adopting us and, and that's the depth of His incredible love. It's an amazing, amazing thing, the love of God. Again, our big idea, bearing the fruit of love is embodying the essence of God and we see that love then is this commitment but not just a commitment, it's a commitment with affection, it's devotion. It's incredible devotion. And we see the links with which he went to love us and adopt us. Here's our second definition of love. Romans 5, 8, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Or over in Ephesians 5, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So love is the devotion of the Father and then love is the sacrifice of the Son. There is something about the sacrifice of the Son that, we, that, that shows us about the, the, the reality of what is this love that is the essence of the Trinitarian God. See, what we're doing today is defining this love within the Trinitarian nature of God, Father, Son, and Spirit. And so we see here that love is indeed seed through the sacrifices we make, the choices we make. 1 John 4, here it is, in this the love of God was made manifest among us. That God sent his only, how did God make his love manifest? That God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. I, I love that. We might live, are you living through Christ? Like if God is your father, then you, you can live through Christ. You can live over here at the tree of life and you can live through Christ. Verse 10, this is love, not that we have loved God but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins or and sent his son as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. You see, your sin required a payment. And so he sent his son to make that payment. It's like this. God desperately wants to adopt you into his family. He wants to be your father. There's only one problem. He's holy and perfect and heaven is holy and perfect. And you can't go to heaven unless you're holy and perfect. Like people wonder why God is so strict about letting sin into heaven. Let me tell you what happened if God let sin into heaven. Sin multiplies. If he let one sin into heaven, heaven would no longer be heaven. Heaven would be just earth again. In no time, it would be overrun. It would be earth. And so heaven, there's no sin. It's perfect and it's holy. And so the gospel, and so what he did is he sent Christ to come and forgive you of your sins, and then he says, I'll take your sin, I'll take your brokenness, I'll take your hurt, I'll take your pain, I'll give you my righteousness. You'll be as righteous as I am, even though we don't behave righteously. I'll make you as righteous as me, and that's what it means to be sanctified and set apart. Like when, when, when he makes us righteous and puts his spirit in us, he sets us apart, we said it last week, to be worshipers. We're set apart, we're, we're, we are now as righteous as Christ is. We have a new creation heart beating within us. Here's what we learn then in this sense. We learn that true love goes beyond our words. Like, yeah, we all need to say we love each other a little more and use those words, but true love ultimately goes beyond our words. It does. In other words, it's not enough to tell somebody we love them. It's not enough to, to, to tell them that we love them, we care about them, we're devoted to them. There comes a time when our actions and choices have to transcend our words. Our love needs to be proven. We do that. We make choices that prove that we love. Well, look at another verse here. A lot of practical little just cross-reference verses today that are so powerful. Here's what, here's what Paul wrote. And what God wants us to know about truth and love. Rather, speaking the truth in love. We're supposed to speak the truth in love. We talked about it last week. We talked about some hard truth last week, right? About, about the world today, about abortion, about homosexuality, all those cultural things going on. And we have to share that message, but we have to share it in love. We speak the truth in love. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. From him, the whole body joined together and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Love is powerful. Love will do incredible things within our church and in our community. But notice that we're to speak the truth in love. You, you, want, you want a great example in the Bible of speaking the truth in love? What's one of the best examples in the Bible of speaking the truth in love? 
the cross. I mean, right? Like God spoke the truth and love on the cross. On the cross, he told us the truth about himself and his son, the truth about you and me and our sin and our relationship with him and our potential in the future if we just let him adopt us into his family. He told us on the cross the truth. See, here's, here's what God didn't do. God didn't just write us a letter and say, I love you. Here it is. I love you. Read about it. I love you. No. He sent his son to hang on the cross and say, no, I love you. I love you, and, and I will make things right for you, and I will give you my life and my righteousness, and I'll forgive you, and I'll adopt you into my family. Whoa, that is some incredible love. And so God spoke the truth in love on the cross. Remember that, that passage in James? And there's a, there's a lot more to this passage, a lot more theology to this, but James talks about faith without works is dead, right? Right? And, and there's this a practical understanding there that, yeah, that's true, that I can say I have faith, but without any actions, like, my faith is dead. We could say the same thing about love. I can say, oh, I love you. I can tell somebody I love them. But if I never make choices that demonstrate that I really love that person, I, I, I'll give a great example. I was watching um, four, four Republicans were, de- were debating in the primary the other night on TV. I didn't watch the whole thing. I watched like a 10-minute uh, clip. Melissa showed me a 10-minute reclip of it. And they asked one question on there that I think a lot of Republicans at least would like to have answered. It's the question, was the last election stolen? So they asked this question, and so all four candidates gave an answer, and most of them, well, all four of them said in some way there was fraud, there was irregularities, there was this, that. Uh, a couple of them were a little more stronger in saying, yeah, I believe it was stolen. Well, the guy that was the most emphatic that it was stolen was the guy, Ryan Kelly, who lives in Allendale, who, if you saw in the news about a month ago, was arrested because he happened to be in Washington, D.C. on January 6th at that protest. And they arrested him for a misdemeanor charge, probably more politically optics than anything after 18 months. But here's the thing. I thought about that. I thought, so you got four candidates all saying, yeah, there was some cheating, yeah, it was some regular... You know. One guy, I believe him, because he went and got arrested <laughs> in Washington. And uh, that's kind of the picture of this. We can say we have love, but do our choices, do our actions prove that reality? See, love without works is as good as dead. So you can tell somebody all you want, you love them, but sometimes your actions and your choices, they're just going to say, I don't believe you. I'm sorry. Those are empty words, empty promises. 1 John 5, 3, John said it this way, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Like, yeah, if we love God, we're just gonna live under his authority. We're gonna obey his word and his word is not gonna be a burden. Let me tell you right now, if God's word is a burden to you, you're not living over here at the tree of the spirit and you just don't understand. You're not, you, your relationship with God, something is off if the word of God is a burden to you. It should not be a burden. Oh yeah, sometimes you'll be attacked for it. Sometimes you'll be persecuted for <laughs> believing what it says and taking a stand for what it says in the world. Yeah, but his love is not a burden. And so again, the idea here is true love goes beyond our words. It goes beyond our feelings, but it goes beyond our words. Like it's not just enough to say, I love you. I'll give you a real-time example of this here. How about, how about Peter? It's, 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 a, it's a, a couple weeks after the resurrection, right? Remember, Jesus and Peter have that, uh, that little campfire get-together lunch. Remember that? It's fascinating. So here's what, here, here, he, Peter was out fishing in his boat. Jesus calls him to the shore. They sit down. They have some lunch together. And when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these fish? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He, had, he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. You know, I noticed something about this little conversation I'd always missed before. 
and it's back in verse 12, and it, it adds a little context to what might have been a little bit irritating to Peter in this. Look at John 21, 12. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. So you understand what's going on here is that Jesus and Peter are having this conversation, but there's other disciples around the campfire too, right? Like there's a bunch of them having dinner and they're all here having dinner and having a conversation and then he looks at Peter and he has this one-on-one -on -one with Peter. Peter, do you love me? And the point here is that in some ways you could say it's an, an indictment on Peter, like Peter, do you love me? If you love me, why are you in your boat? Why aren't you in my boat? Why aren't you, why aren't you feeding my sheep and, and catching my fish? And why aren't you out there pursuing the gospel? We talked about this back uh, at the first of the year, that there's really something even deeper going on here, right? That, that in some senses, Jesus is kind of asking this question to Peter. Peter, do you not get how much I love you? Because like, yeah, I know you denied me three times, and I know you dropped the ball, and I know you're embarrassed. That's okay. I, I've forgiven you. Let go of your guilt and your shame, and let's get back to the business of feeding the sheep and making an, an eternal difference with the gospel in the world. And that's exactly what he's saying to Peter there. It's like, yeah, I love you. And there's something about that, that when we grasp how much God loves us, it'll be much easier for us then to love God. And this is what is so beautiful about this, because as, as they're having this conversation, Jesus knows the potential of Peter. Here's the potential of Peter. Truly, truly, Jesus prophesies, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will, will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God, and after saying this, he said to him, follow me. So the whole time he's asking, Peter, do you love me? He knows Peter loves him. He knows Peter will one day eventually end up crucified just like Jesus was because he loved him. Because he really loved him. But he's pressing Peter on this, I think, in part to say, Peter, do you know how much I love you? Do you get it? And the more you grasp my love for you, the more you'll be able to then love me in return. The more I grasp God's love for me, the more I will love him then in return. Good, good, good stuff. Let's go to a third definition of love. I'm going to jump ahead here a little bit. And just think about this, you know, though. You know, when, we get, when you get married, you tell the other person you are marrying that they are the most important person in the world to you. You love them more than anyone or anything, more than life itself. You know what happens once you're living in the same house day after day, year after year though, right? Those words get tested. You have the opportunity to prove that you really do love the other person. It's one thing to say it in front of an audience of onlookers. It is another to pra practice it in a room with just two people. Love makes all the difference at home, at work, in our relationships because our love goes beyond the superficial words we speak to the sacrificial choices we make. So bearing the fruit of love then again, it's embodying the essence of God, which is a love that is devoted and it's a love that is sacrificial, a love that goes beyond my feelings and a love that goes beyond my words. And here is the third definition of love, okay? Devotion to the Father, sacrifice to the Son, and number three, love is the fruit of the Spirit. Love is then the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5.23, the, the fruit of the Spirit is love. And what we're going to do for the next several weeks as we go through this series is just pick these fruits off one by one and look at them. Kind of Kind of, but what I want to do this morning here as we end is just look at this passage here with a little bit of context, a little bit of theological underpinning so we understand what's going on here. I got just a few, a few notes about, about this fruit of the Spirit that will be helpful. Number one, the root of the fruit of the Spirit. Here's the, the thing I've made this point. In the past, there is one fruit and then there are nine flavors. And, and I've said this before, and I think I understand this better than I ever have. So, so look at it like this. There is the fruit, singular, of the Spirit, and that fruit is love. And then there are nine flavors. And so think of it like this. It's like, 
It's like you've got original orange juice. That's love. And then you've got pineapple orange juice and mango orange juice and tangerine orange juice, right? And peach orange juice and strawberry orange juice and, and strawberry banana peach orange juice, and right? Nine different flavors. And that's what joy and peace and patience and kind, all of those are. They're all an expression of love, which is the essence of God. They all come from the essence of God. And they're expressions of his essence in some ways. They're expressions that are relative to us. So just that's one thing to understand. One fruit, nine flavors. The root of the fruit, the, the core fruit here, flavor is love. And then look at this one here. Look at Galatians 5, second thing. Galatians 5, 16. I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh for these are opposed to each other. And this kind of goes back to the Garden of Eden, right? Walk in the spirit. Don't walk over here in the flesh. Get, get behind the feast off the right tree as Adam and Eve were supposed to, right? So just think about that. And if the fruit of the spirit thrives over here in the spirit, and, and here's the reality. Adam and Eve could not be at both trees at the same time, could they? Like if they had been over here at this tree, they wouldn't have been over there violating that tree and, and violating the authority of God and, and falling into great sin. We can't be at both trees at once. We walk in the flesh or we walk in the spirit and uh, it's just the way it is. But let me show you something truly fascinating and we've looked at this before, but it's in this passage. This tree over here is the tree of the knowledge of Good and evil. There's two sides to this tree, which confuses things a little bit, right? And what Paul does here in this passage is juxtaposes the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit with this tree in two different ways. The Spirit and the flesh are opposed to each other. The Spirit and the flesh are opposed to each other. What does he say? Now, the works of the flesh are evident. This is obvious. Like, it's obvious that if you're doing the works of the flesh, you're not, doing, you're not bearing the fruit of the Spirit. So these, these are opposed to each other. The fruit of the Spirit is opposed to each other. Maybe I didn't put that on the screen yet. Sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. They're opposed to each other. Now, watch this juxtaposition then from two different angles, right? Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Think obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. And here's the juxtaposition, right? The works of the flesh are, are, are juxtaposed against the fruit of the Spirit. Like the fruit of the Spirit, the works of the flesh. They're opposed to each other. And, and this tree over here, this is the unrighteousness, like living in evil. It's the unrighteousness that we can live in. That's the evident one. The other one's a little more surprising. Juxtaposition number two, look at this. Verse 18, if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Against such things there is no law. What does that mean? What does it mean when, God's, when, when Paul says we're not under the law? It means, well, we're not under the law. Against such things there is no... I've always wrestled with that line. Against such things there is no... What does that mean? Against, against the fruit of the Spirit there is no law. What does he like mean by that? Well, here's the juxtaposition number two. The law of God is juxtaposed against the fruit of the Spirit. Like if you have the law of God over here, like Ten Commandments on stone, and you have the fruit of the Spirit over here, well, yeah, we're supposed to bear the fruit of the Spirit. We were never designed, we were never intended to live under a law. Never. And so you see, both of those are juxtaposed. This is kind of like the self-righteousness that Jesus encountered throughout his ministry, right? Like all of those Jewish leaders who, boy, they loved the law, didn't they? They loved the law. They redefined the law. They, they, they really kept the law, and it made them very righteous. Only it didn't. Just self-righteous. They were over here at the tree in their flesh keeping this law. And yeah, they were not living and bearing the fruit of the Spirit over here at the tree of the Spirit. Again, against such things there is no law or against, against spiritual fruit there is no law. What does that line mean? I think that's what it means is that when you have the fruit of the Spirit, you no longer need the law of God. Right? You don't, you, don't, you don't need these Ten Commandments written on stone when you have the fruit of the Spirit. 
It's like, and he, so here's the point. Look at it this way. It's not that the law is bad. It's that the fruit of the Spirit is better. Like the fruit of the Spirit is more effective in helping me live a righteous life than trying to keep a set of laws. In fact, think of it this way. Like, like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Okay, before they sinned, did God give them a law? Did they need a law? Now, some might say, well, if they, God had given them Ten Commandments, they might not have fallen into sin. And you see the fallacy of that right away because the problem wasn't that they didn't have Ten Commandments. The problem was that they had what? They had one commandment. Thou shalt not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they couldn't even keep one law. And they violated it. And we, we always need God's grace. And so what God does is God gives us the fruit of, now the law served its purpose in its time and the law pointed people to the gospel and pointed people to Christ and the law pointed out that we couldn't keep it and that we needed God's grace. And then he gave us his grace as he gave us his spirit and his righteousness and now we can bear the fruit of the spirit. In fact, the reality is the law can do nothing about our sin, can it? It's helpless. All it can do is point out our sin. It can't do anything about it. The fruit of the spirit does something about my sin. When I walk over here in the Spirit, it actually counters the sin in my life. It keeps me from sinning, which the law can not do. There are great similarities here, like the, the, the Ten Commandments are all about the character of God. Like, like God says, thou shalt not kill because I am life. God says, thou shalt not lie because I am the truth. God says, thou shalt have no other gods because I'm a jealous God. This shows his character, but you know the fruit of the Spirit also is the character of Christ. The character of Christ at work in our life, both of them, and, and the reality is, what's the goal? The goal of the law was what? That we would love God and love others, and what's the goal of the fruit of the Spirit that we would love? And the question is, which is more effective at helping me do that? Walking in the Spirit and bearing the fruit of the Spirit. See, if you have the Spirit of God, you don't need the law of God. And that's what Paul is saying there. Because sometimes we read that and it's like, what does Paul mean? Paul says we're not under the law. Like, aren't, aren't the Ten Commandments good? And Yeah, they're good. But if you have the Spirit of God living in you, you don't need Ten Commandments on stone. You have the Spirit of God in your heart. Now, if you don't have the Spirit of God, you need the law. We know the law is good, says Paul, if one uses it lawfully. Understanding this, the law is not laid down for the just, for the Christian, for the believer, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and the profane. If you don't know Christ, you need the law to point you to Christ and say, you need saved. Look how bad your life is. That's the reality. And then finally, look at this in verse 17. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. Galatians 5, 17. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Here's the reality, why the spirit is so much more powerful than the law, right? Is that the spirit of God gives us the desires of God. It's like, it's like you, you got this new creation heart. It's like you, like you get this new computer and there's a software loaded on it and you have this software loaded on you where you just love God and you, you just have to renew that software, renew your mind all the time. But God has given you his desires. You don't want, you don't want to break the law. You have no desire to break the law. And the reality is over here, what, what Jesus did, what Jesus, right? He took the law and he, he kind of raised it like, 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 you might say, well, I never murdered anybody. And Jesus said, did you get angry at him? You murdered him. If you got angry at him, you murdered him. And over here, the Spirit helps me not to get angry and not to lust and, and, and actually helps me keep the higher standard of the law. That's what the Spirit of God does in my life. It is a truly amazing thing. And so as we go through this and we look at these nine flavors of, of this incredible fruit, just understand it is God working in my life. It is God producing and I am simply bearing what he produces as I walk in the Spirit. The question then becomes, how do I abound more and more in love? How can I experience more and more of God's love in my life? Okay, and we saw this. True love goes beyond my feelings. It goes beyond my words. But here's the amazing thing. Look at this. Okay, love is devotion of the Father. 
So true love goes beyond our feelings. We're just going to blow you away here. Watch this. And then number two, love is the sacrifice of the Son. True love goes beyond our words. And then number three, love is the fruit of the Spirit. And you know what? True love goes beyond our actions. True love goes beyond our actions. How can they, you might say, how is that? Like, I get it. Like, it's more than my feelings and more than my, my words. But how is love more than my choices and actions? Like, like, wasn't the greatest demonstration of God's love when he sent his son to die on the cross? No. What was the greatest demonstration of God's love? God. That's just who he is. That's coming and dying on the cross is relative to you and me and we see his love in that context and we can understand. But God is just love. Just being who he is. God is love. And so here's the key, the fruit of the Spirit. Every single flavor is a noun and not a verb. Every single verb, every, every single fruit of the Spirit, uh, love is a, is a masculine noun and then every other flavor is, or fruit is a masculine noun and then every flavor, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, on, they're all feminine nouns. They're all nouns, not verbs. This is not what I do, this is who I am. That's the point. When I'm over here in the Spirit, it's the Spirit of God just living through me. I'm just bearing the fruit of the Spirit. Ah, that's just wild. And and, and we this everything we teach here goes back all always goes back to the same point, right? Always goes back to our identity. Everything. It's there. It's just so obvious to see. Today's big idea, bearing the fruit of love is embracing the essence of God. Let me give you fine, these final four implications to the believers. There is no one I can't love. Just know this. There's no one you cannot love today. There's not a person you can't love. If you have a hard time saying you love them or showing you love them or feeling like you love them, at the, at the least, you can pray for them. There is no one that you can't love. Why? Because you have the essence of God. You have God's love in you as a believer. You have the essence of God's love in you. There is nobody beyond your love and there is no one that I hate. So if you think there's somebody you hate and if there's someone you think gets on your nerves and you can't stand that person, just know that's not really true. That's, you're being lied to by the enemy. There's nobody you hate because you have the love of God in your life. You may hate their actions, you may hate their behaviors, you may hate how they treat, treat you, but again, you can pray for them and you can feel sorry for them and for the struggles they have in their life. And then I have no fear of judgment day. Like, if I have this love, I have no fear of judgment whatsoever of judgment because I know God has forgiven me. I know God loves me. I know God has taken, God has, Jesus took all of God's wrath for my sin on himself God is no longer angry about any of the sin past present or future in my life it's been dealt with that's that's the way the gospel works and it's pretty radical but it is your sins were forgiven given past present future every sin when Jesus died was in the future like all those sins in the future your sins were all in the future they've all been taken care of and so I have no fear of judgment day whatsoever because I know the incredible love that God has for me. And then finally, love is the very essence of God in my life. It's the very essence of God in my life. Like That's the fruit of the Spirit. God is love at His core. His Spirit is in me. I have the essence of God in my life. I love this verse, Ephesians 6, 24. Here's a great verse to, to, to memorize. This is a little verse tucked away at the end of Ephesians. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. That's the love you have because you have the essence of God's love in you. It is a love incorruptible. Just just ponder, what does that mean? That I have a love that's incorruptible? I have a love that can't be destroyed, corrupted? I have a love that is pure and gen- Yeah. And if I'm walking in the Spirit, I'll embrace, I'll embody that love. If I'm over here, I might have a man-made view of that love at best. And at worst, I may... Embrace my fleshly desires. The fruit of the love is embodying the essence of God. So love is defined, it's devotion, not emotion. It is sacrificial, not superficial. And it is identity, not activity. Identity, let me leave you with this last thing I just wrote. 
some final thoughts. Let me close with one final thought. It had, has to do with the word devotion. I feel like this word needed a qualifier. Even when I used it earlier in the message, I both liked the use of the word and questioned it. Here is the qualifier. While God is devoted to us, he is also and even more so devoted to himself. In fact, he is first and foremost devoted to himself. His first devotion is always to himself, meaning we never become, as in, modern, in a modern day romance or love song, the object of his world. Maybe this is why people get so confused about God's love and ask, I want to know what love is. Maybe this will help. A few years back, a popular worship song came out that became very controversial, The Reckless Love of God. Many loved it. Some thought the song was reckless theology, declaring in our worship that God is reckless. He isn't, they say. Well, they say it's not Him, but His love. Still. And yet herein, maybe this sermon has answered the dilemma of that song. A song I love to sing, but I have questioned in my own mind its theological declaration. God is not reckless, and his love has never been reckless when simply looking at the essence of who God is to himself. Yet relative to you and me, his love looks mighty reckless. The God of the universe lowering himself to love me with such devotion. But that devotion has always been about God being true to who he is, not just his being there for me. Yet the God who is true to himself is the God who will go to supernatural lengths to express his love for the very ones, you and me, who could in no way fathom how great the love of God truly is. And maybe that is where the reckless part comes in. We think it reckless that God would even try and communicate his love to us, let alone fill us with the very essence of that love. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you. Somebody today needs to hear. God wants to adopt them into his family. If that's you today, come talk to me. But all you have to do is say, I want to be adopted. I admit I'm a sinner. I I believe you love me. I believe you died for me. Give me your life. Give me your righteousness. Give me your hope. Give me your love. All you do is ask him and he'll adopt you into his family. And Lord, the rest of us today, we just need to know how much you love us and how much love you have poured into our hearts. Romans 5, 5, through the Holy Spirit, God's love has been poured into our hearts. We need to know how much love we have for the world around us, that the fruit we bear is the fruit we give away to others. Show us that in the next several weeks. Go before us now today. May may our lives honor and glorify you and may we walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh. Jesus' name, everyone said, amen.